What is going on, people? Welcome to this video where I'm going to explain to you the full story process journey of my transformation, my eight month transformation where I went from this to this. This is going to be a raw video where I get incredibly caffeinated and just sit down like we're best friends and basically explain to you everything I did, the full story, um, all the things that I couldn't put in the transformation video, how I trained, how I dieted, basically the full uncut raw story going over everything that I couldn't put in the transformation video from here in a long, raw format style, casual blase off the cuff video. It's going to be a tough one for me because there's a lot of footage in here that I, I didn't want to watch or I haven't watched. Um, there's going to be a lot of raw clips and things like I'm going to relive it basically and uh, just explain to you everything like where is that mentally, what I did to get through it. I get a lot of people asking me like how do you deal with not being able to train and the isolation and other things. Viewer discretion is advised as well because there is some pretty gross gnarly bits in here. Uh, so be warned going into this. This is the full story of my transformation. So a little bit about me. Um, I mentioned in the video that I was always like a bit of a weird kid. My childhood wasn't bad, but I would get picked on. I would get bullied. So I'd get on, on the bus home, for example, the bigger kids would fucking not be very nice. And I'd run home to my mum, cry my eyes out because I felt like everyone hated me and no one didn't like me. But overall, my childhood is pretty good, dude. And when I, when I was younger, like I felt like I was never really in a proper group. Like I was kind of like, I had some friends that were like the chads who used to go and play sports every now and then I might go and do that. But then I'd also spend a lot of lunch times playing Minecraft in a computer room or playing like video games on computers at lunch just to kind of like escape everyone with like all the nerdy kids. So I was never really like in a fixed group. And I, I don't want to make out like my life was so hard. My childhood was horrendously bad and I was beaten up every day and all this stuff. Yeah, sure, I was thrown down some stairs and I was beaten up and like so, some shit did happen, but I think it happens to everyone as well. And I was, I was diagnosed with a condition called lymphedema when I was about 10 years old. And what happened was one day I got ill and I didn't know what it was. Um, I, I was ill for a period of weeks. I couldn't walk. My dad had to carry me everywhere. I had to be carried by my parents. And eventually I was finally diagnosed with this condition. I think it was actually a few years before they, or like a year before they actually found out what it was called lymphedema. And this basically means that my lymphatic system in my left leg doesn't work properly. So I have to wear this black leg support on my leg. It's a degenerative incurable condition. It's meant to get worse as you get older, but I refuse to accept that. And I refuse to believe that I will live a full and fucking sick life. And it just basically means that I have to wear this leg support on my leg at all times or I'd literally be disabled. So yeah, um, I've got this condition called lymphedema in my leg, which makes me, it does a couple of things, right? So first of all, it makes my leg swell. So if I don't wear a leg support, if I don't wear the black thing on my leg, then within probably about half a day, a few hours of me walking around without it, my leg would literally balloon to like the elephant man or like a fucking tree trunk. Um, so that is obviously not good. Um, so I have to wear the leg support for that or I would be a cripple. It also means that if I cut it, uh, I'm prone to infection because the, the basically what's happened is when I was younger, they don't know whether I, it's something that just happened or like I damaged it. I used to do a lot of biking and I had a few crashes where I got like the handlebar in my groin, which is where a lot of the lymphatic vessels are. But if you imagine like a small a system of veins, almost like the veins that go around your body, but really, really small. They can, they, they transport something called lymphatic fluid. It's involved in your immune system, involved in transporting waste, um, involved in various things. Like if you bang your arm and it swells up, it's due to your lymphatic system. So it's pretty important. And basically mine's damaged. So in my left leg, it doesn't drain properly, which means that I get all kinds of problems uh, with infection. If I cut it, like I said, with um, swelling and other things, which can be uncomfortable and not very nice. And when I was younger, this really used to affect me like, like mentally, like I used to be so insecure about it. I, I, it made me very shy, um, very embarrassed. Like I, if anyone mentioned it, I used to go into a separate changing room to get changed and hide from the kids because I didn't want to get bullied for having like a black thing on my leg. Um, when I got my first girlfriend when I was younger, I wouldn't let her see me in like underwear or shorts. I would never wear shorts. If it was like 30, 40 degrees, I'd wear trousers because I didn't, I was embarrassed of the leg support. Um, I'd go to the bathroom to get changed to take it off in front of my girlfriend. It really, really affected my life and made me like, it made me hate myself a little bit when I was younger and it gave me this anxiety about bit judgment from others and like I just wanted to fit in when I knew that I didn't and really felt like I didn't which in hindsight is stupid um, so I started to train I wanted to be more confident I wanted to be able to have better interactions with girls I didn't want to be the guy that like is too scared to ask the girl out or too scared to like 
try and kiss someone in school or whatever and then get rejected. But then I'd never even get to that stage because I'd be too scared to even like put myself out there or try or ask if someone wanted to go on a date. But I'd end up going home by myself wondering like what could have been. And that was fucking painful. And I didn't want to go through that anymore. I started to train because I wanted to be more confident. I wanted to get more girls. I wanted to be someone that I would like look in the mirror and, and, and like and want to see. So I began training at about 15, 16 years old, which is when I first made that transformation video. Got in really, really good shape. And then as per the original video, when I was about 18, got sick, got an infection in my knee, went through all that shit, lost all of my size, got down to about 60 kilograms. And uh, then that's when I made the OG transformation video that took off and like kickstarted my career into fitness. In the past, I've got infections where my knee has like become infected due to my immune system being like extra fragile and extra prone. And to cut a long story short, uh, the video started when I got a flu. Like I didn't know what it was. It was like flu-like symptoms. I was ill for a few days and then I seemed to have got better and I had this pain in my knee, which gradually got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I like knew deep down what it was because I've been through this before. And that just got worse and spread to my ankle. My whole knee was in absolute agony until I couldn't walk at all. I had to get around in a freaking wheelchair, which is not good. So I went to the hospital um, and they did something called a knee aspiration, which is where they put a big needle inside your knee joint drain yeah, the fluid really off it's it. about as painful as it sounds it's fucking not nice and they they drain the fluid off pull the fluid out and they run the fluid for testing to see what's inside oh. the knee and the guy actually screwed it up once when he did it no anesthetic no painkiller nothing like that and as you can tell it's not very enjoyable so I didn't I didn't mention this in the video but I when I went for this like knee aspiration thing I went in and they didn't take my heart rate my temperature anything like that and then I I asked them to as I was leaving and I was like are you not going to do my obs my observations so they took my temperature took my heart rate took my blood pressure and they look bad. Like I had a temperature, my heart rate is elevated, my blood pressure was low. So they were like, okay, that's not good. You have to stay in. It's like, if I didn't mention that, I would have just been sent home. So I didn't actually go home and get a call. I think I was still there. And then I ended up staying in, maybe coming back after getting my stuff. I knew that I was down shit creek. I kind of knew, like expected to have a surgery, but in the past I've been out within a few weeks. Like other than the main transfer, other than the first video that I made, it like hasn't actually been that bad. Um, but I did not, I, I had no idea what was coming. Yeah, I got surgery today basically. And I thought it'd be funny to tell the surgeon that I want the do not resuscitate. It's pretty typical the day that I have the surgery, I wake up my knee is like <laughs> significantly better for the first time. Um, long story short, got admitted to hospital, had the first surgery, and I seemed to get better and I was like okay sick it's over it's done with I'm gonna be on the road to recovery little hiccup and then I got worse again and I started to get better and worse and deteriorate and not very good so he took me into another surgery had another surgery and I go through these phases where I seem to get a little bit better and then immediately after the surgery and then I just get worse due to the infection um, they isolated me so I was in a room by myself which at first was cool but when you spend 24 hours a day seven days a week for a prolonged period of time with no one to speak to by yourself with no visitors because of the C, C word, the pandemic. Like, it is very difficult. Anyway, um, was holding out pretty well. That was all good. Had the first surgery, it started to get worse and then had a second surgery and started to get worse. And I was still in kind of high spirits. Like I'm pretty, in these situations, I think it's it's a true test of character. It's like, if you, if you go through some shit, if you go through something bad, you can think of it and be like, okay, I can either moan and cry about how hard my circumstances are, or I can lead by example and like show that I've got a strong character. I'm gonna be strong. I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna inspire other people. And that's kind of like the mindset that I go in with it. Go into it with like I'm gonna be fucking strong and a lot of people aren't gonna be able to handle this but I can I'm gonna be able to do it so like I was all right and I haven't told anyone this before but I used to be a hypochondriac so I used to be scared of dying and illnesses and I used to think I was gonna die like every day as a kid when I was like six seven eight I'll get into bed and I'll just cry myself to sleep because I was like convinced I was gonna die of like cancer or like die of some like weird spinal disease or some weird disease like I used to be convinced that I was gonna die and so scared of doctors as well it's quite funny like careful what you wish for um, and injections and anything to do with a hospital I was petrified and it's like now I've been through so much shit that I actually quite enjoy it like it's almost it's almost fucked up but I quite the the fact that I was so scared and now I've overcome that and I can deal with it and go in for surgeries and not be like worried obviously my heart rate's a little bit elevated I'm a little bit stressed before getting put under like put to sleep but knowing that I can actually like handle it well and like 
deal with it and do it, go through it by myself. Like I would have never imagined like doing this on my own is like actually quite rewarding. So it's kind of the way that you look at it as well. But anyway, um, ended up having two surgeries on the knee and kept getting worse. So was not getting better. My CRP, the inflammation marker in your blood kept going up and up and up and up. Um, I was still spiking a temperature. Like every time I thought I was getting better, thought I was about to go home, then that'd be stripped away from me because I get a temperature and I'd get to these stages where I was like, okay, I'm going home now. And I'd be like, no, you're not. Sorry, you have to stay in or you have to go for another surgery. And man, like that started to wear away at me. Like the combining with being by myself was so fucking difficult. But yeah, I was by myself. It's pretty boring. And I also kept getting this thing called phlebitis, I think, which is inflammation of your veins. So where they put cannulas in my arm, um, where they put like the IV and the antibiotics and the drugs into you, they my veins would reject it. So after about a day or two, my veins would go rock hard. And when they gave me the antibiotics, it'd feel like my, my veins were literally burning like they're injecting bleach into me and this is also due to the nhs the Na national health service in england not being very good so like they were meant to flush the ivs through after i had my antibiotics with a saline solution which is like uh, salty water and quite often the nurses would just forget or I'd be waiting like six hours with this like IV still in after the antibiotics finished, which would just cause my veins to go like rock hard and inflamed and it put me in agony. So it got to a point where I just hobble out on my crutches, go to the nurse's like drug cabinet, take the syringes out myself and then just flush my own cannulas or flush my own syringes because no one else would be there to do it for me. So I was like literally injecting myself with the saline and then I'd take the IVs out as well because I'd be waiting all day for a doctor to do it. And then the nurse would come by like, oh, someone already done it. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, someone's already done it. So that's pretty funny as well. You just got to find things that keep you entertained. And there's a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is really, really good. I recommend everyone everyone reads it. And it's about finding like dealing is that for someone called Viktor Frankl, who was in Auschwitz concentration camp in the Holocaust, really, really nasty stuff. People getting literally executed like cattle. Um, and the, the the whole the whole book is basically talking about finding meaning in suffering and it's like how people survive such like traumatic horrible things that other people simply can't handle is the ones who survive find the meaning in the suffering that, that they find like a reason for it they find something good that will come out of it so it's like with that with my time in hospital, I know that I was going to come back better. I knew I was going to make this video. I knew I was going to absolutely smash it. I know that people are going to get motivated from it. I know that I can be strong for my my family and like not moaning and crying on the phone every day. Christmas came around. Christmas in the hospital was not very fun by myself when I'm meant to be with my family. I see everyone on social media like with their families having fun. I'm eating this shitty like disgusting soup. I'm feeling pretty sorry for myself at this point. Like it's just starting to wear on me, man. That the time spent in the hospital but you just got to look for little things like that that are entertaining or bring you joy and enjoyment and like appreciate the little stuff like you've got to be glad that you're getting the medical treatment I was glad that I was alive I was glad that I was actually getting treated and not like at home literally dying by myself or somewhere in the other in another part of the world where you wouldn't be able to get any medical treatment or anything so it's, it's about being grateful like for what you do have rather than looking for the things that, that, that you don't that's how like during these times Generally, I'm probably happier or in a more positive mindset in this hospital than I am a lot of the time outside of it because it makes you appreciate everything that you do have and how lucky you are and how fortunate your life is that you can walk and like all you want to do is walk but you can do that normally and that you're you can see and you can hear you're not blind you're not deaf you're not disabled you're not terminally ill like it really makes you appreciate that and realize like how you're just lucky that you haven't got these horrendous things happening to you all the time. And even this, like in the hospital, the stay man, like people go through so much worse. This ain't shit. All right, so surgery number two is going down in a couple of hours. And I basically got to decide where I want like my knee joint like removed or if I should argue for surgery and get something less invasive. But it's so fucking hard, man, because like, I don't fucking know. Time tick by in hospital. Christmas came and went. Christmas was quite tough by myself, uh, being in hospital, being in the room alone. But then, what I didn't mention in the video is my girlfriend Queen actually came to visit me, which is good. So you're allowed one visitor for 30 minutes a day or something, but the visitor can only be one person. So I wanted I wanted to see my girlfriend, but she lives six hours away. So she couldn't come down for the first like few weeks. And I was like, okay, I want to see Queen. I want to see my girlfriend. She's called Queen, by the way. 
Um, I want to see her. So I'm just going to literally isolate myself until she can get a few days off work. So I sacrificed seeing anyone else so I could see her for the few days for the weekend that she should get off work. So after Christmas, um, she came and saw me, which is really, really good. Absolute star. Like it made me, it, ma it made it bearable, man. Like I didn't give her any props in the transformation video because I didn't have time for it. But honestly, she was like a fucking, as cheesy as it is, like a rock for me. I love you to bits. She came to visit just before New Year's, which is cool. Um, I actually escaped on new year's so i left the hospital ward i was so done with like being in there i was like oh yeah just to the nurse I was like, i'm just going for a walk on my crutches and they're like uh no no leaving the hospital grounds i was like yeah yeah i'm going clubbing and then the thing is i actually went clubbing so i went to a nightclub which is quite funny i walked in there just for the new year's countdown walked in there straight i was like trying to be incognito straight away the girl was like why have you got a cannula in your arm? Because I was trying to hide it. And she was like, oh my God, I'm a nurse, a girl on the door. And I was like, oh, fucking hell. Walked straight into the club, straight away, two people recognized me. I'm like, oh, I thought you were in hospital. Like, are you out? And I was like, oh no. So anyway, stayed for the countdown and then went back to my hospital bed um, to, uh, for, for the rest of New Year's. But that, that was kind of nice, man. And then, and then Queen left and then I was back by myself, but I thought I was getting out. Um, and then once again, I took another turn for the worse and then found out that I needed to have a more invasive surgery um, where they basically remove the lining inside my knee joint. And this is when I really started to struggle. So it was like, I thought I was getting out. I thought this was it. I'd already been in for a few weeks. And then they were like, no, you're going to have this. It's going to be a six month to a year recovery time. And then they told me that I would never regain full mobility and it would probably affect me for the rest of my life um, in terms of the surgery. Like I wouldn't be as flexible. Uh, and then I literally said to the surgeon, I was like, I will, before the surgery, I was like, I will be better than ever within a year and obviously she wasn't like ha, ha 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 but i could tell she was like yeah whatever like she like she, she she did not have a fucking like she basically laughed at me like and i looked at her i was like i will be better than ever in under a year and i will go beyond what i have been and she was like yeah yeah whatever anyway 5th of january Went in for the surgery. I was actually pretty nervous this one. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, they do something called a nerve block. So I'm probably put to sleep put under and they do a nerve block on my leg, which is where they completely paralyze my leg. And I didn't actually know this, but they said that they do the nerve block because... Do you know when you're put to sleep, even though you're put to sleep and you're not conscious, your body still feels pain? And I was like, they're explaining this to me before I was going in for surgery. I was like, fucking fantastic. And she was like, yeah, so if there's a really painful surgery and this is going to be like a really painful surgery, even though you're asleep, your body can will still respond to the pain. So it's like why a lot of old people die on the operating table because they their body can't deal with the pain, their heart rate elevates and they'll go have something like a cardiac arrest. So they have to give you painkillers even though while you're asleep or like a nerve or like paralyze the leg or give you a nerve block or something so you can't feel it so you don't like fucking go into shock and die on the operating table. And I was there thinking like what if like you just feel everything through the surgery, like everything and then all the anesthetic does is makes you forget about it like I, I still don't know this to this day because they don't actually know how anesthetic works mate i'm in the recovery room and i currently see about nine different phone screens surgery was a success apparently they like removed the lining of my knee joint and basically did a knee reconstruction like took apart my knee and my kneecap out tea and biscuits Yes, please. Okay. Anything but custard creams. <laughs> Why? Bit, you don't like custard creams? They're a bit rubbish. I want to start by saying that I do not take painkillers. I decline painkillers up until now, um, up until when they give them to me when I'm asleep in the surgery, like through me, not what like against my will. Uh, I don't take painkillers. And this next bit is kind of relevant because this, this was the most pain I'd ever been in in my entire it gives me goosebumps thinking about it like th th this was next level shit i didn't realize the human body was capable of experiencing so much discomfort i thought i had a high pain threshold from surgeries from like injuries from having these leg problems I woke up knee was killing because the nerve block that they did like wore off so i didn't have any pain medication um, I woke up and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse to the point where I was like sweating, shaking, about to throw up. Obviously, I didn't film it, um, but I woke up at three in the morning. The nerve block had worn off and I can't even explain to you what it felt like. All I can explain to you is what I did. I was sweating through my clothes, through my bed sheets. I was like dry heaving, almost throwing up. I was like rolling off the bed. I was just like smashing that button for like the nurse to come in and I was like... 
give me the fucking strongest painkiller that you've got. So they gave me morphine. Uh, it made it a little bit better, but then the next 24 hours are a bit of a blur. But anyway, plan for today is, is I'm currently on loads of painkillers. So I can still feel the need, but I'm on morphine. Um, I've had some like edibles as well, uh, which I've all brought into hospital with me and paracetamol. And it's bearable right now. But plan for today is, is to remove the drain, remove the drain from my knee, the like tube going into it. Yeah, so after that third surgery, when I thought I was going home before it, um, but I wasn't, I was like, there was no end in sight. Like, I didn't know when this was going to end. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if it was going to get better because every time I thought I was going to get better, it'd be like taken away from me and I'd end up spending more weeks in hospital going through more pain and more surgeries. And then after that third one, I, I kind of had like a mindset shift. Like, I was in a really bad place after my girlfriend left, after Queen left. And I was like, it's the first time where I was, it's a bit embarrassing. It's the first time where I was actually like, I'm fucking done. Like, I don't know how I can handle this anymore. I can't do it. After coming, coming up to a month, I was like, I literally don't fucking know. Anyway, I had that third surgery and, and something just flipped in my head, man. And I was like, right. It's cliche, it's cheesy, but I was like, I was like, I was like, I'm not fucking staying in here any longer. Like we are going to get ourselves out of here. We're going to do everything we possibly can. And I was like, I'm not going to sit in bed. Um, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself and be in this place any longer. So what I started to do was I started to get dressed every single day, even though I could, could, couldn't leave my bed or could barely move. Um, I started to put wear, wear normal clothes every single day to be like, okay, yeah, we're, we're not staying in a fucking hospital gown. We're getting out of here. So every day I'd, I'd have a shower in this like little disabled, I'd like drag myself, like crawl to the shower, sit in disabled shower with my with my knee out um it wasn't it was fucking painful and then i'd get changed like i was going home every single day i would do this just to like instill that mentality of like i am going home i'm not staying here your discretion is advised do not watch this next part if you're screamish basically i've got this like vacuum drain that goes into my knee and it's like draining all the shit out of it um so i had the surgery earlier and look how fucking gross this is man Mmm. Strawberry smoothie. <laughs> After surgery, they had like a knee drain in my knee, which is the tube that goes inside your knee joint. Nurse came to take it out and I was like, is this going to be painful? And she was like... So all I do is I get you to take a deep breath. Yeah. And when you're breathing out, I pull it. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> I was like, this doesn't sound like it's not going to be painful to me. She didn't say anything. It was like, three, two, one. Pulls this like six inch tube from inside of my knee. Uh, and then we could like get to work. So saw some physios and they decided to try and get me out of bed. Like this is the same day or the following day from a surgery. And dude, the blood went back into my knee. And as you can probably tell, like I was not happy. Like my, I was literally going to pass out. I've, I've, I've fallen. I've been unconscious a few times after accidents and like, you just know when you're going to black out or when John Jones choked me out. Like I just, you just know when you're going as soon as I stood up, like that pain hit me and I was like, Nope, I'm fucking going to pass out. So got straight into bed, uh, back to square one, fresh out of surgery, tubes taken out of my leg and uh, my leg is effectively locked out. It can't fully straighten, um, which is incredibly frustrating. Imagine staying in one position with a body part for a few hours, how achy and how like sore it gets. Now imagine that for weeks. Now imagine that not being able to physically move it out of that position. Like it was horrible. So I couldn't fully straighten my leg um, and I couldn't bend it either. It probably bend about that much. So they put me in this machine called the CPM machine, which is this thing that bends your leg very, very slightly. It's like my leg, obviously I know my leg bends, but it's like my leg wouldn't bend. It's like someone telling you, oh, your finger, right? If you bend it backwards hard and enough, it will eventually bend bend backwards like that normally all you've got to do is force it into that position it's like my leg wasn't physically capable of bending or straightening it was just it was it felt like my leg was gonna rip out like it was it was not good um so i got into this machine and every day I started cranking it. They gave me the remote for it. This gave me like a goal or a purpose. And I think like in anything like this, it, it, it's so important to have goals and still like go towards something and do things or you're just going to want to top yourself. And my goal was to get to a certain number on this CPM machine. All right, so we got to 85 degrees of bend on the CPM machine today. I would force my leg. It would like mechanically force my leg 
into this position and every single time it went up it would bring me more pain and more discomfort but then it would it would it would push it like a tiny bit further then the next time it went up i'd get to that same level a little bit easier and it wouldn't be quite as painful then i'd push it even harder again like constantly stepping outside of my comfort zone a little bit a little bit at a time all right this isn't going to be easy or pain free or fun but we are getting 90 degrees on my knee today let's fucking go this is the maximum that I can bend my leg. My kneecap is going to rip open. Like, it doesn't physically go that, but go any further than that. Like, it's not mechanically possible. That's what it feels like. But I kept pushing it harder and harder and harder every single day until we got to a place where I had some kind of movement and mobility in my knee. I still couldn't bend my leg um, freely. Like, I still couldn't lift it up or walk or put pressure on it or anything like that. But we had started to get it moving. After almost a month in hospital, I was finally allowed to go home. 12th of January. And this is in the waiting room to go home. And this is me training my leg. Whenever I got a minute to do it, I would push it as hard as I could. This is another stupid thing that I did. First thing that I did when I was taken out of like discharge from hospital is my friend picked me up. Um, I couldn't even really get in the car because my leg wouldn't really bend properly. And I wanted to see my girlfriend. Like I was not staying in a house by myself after a month in a room on my own. I I got home and was like, nah, fuck this. I want to see my girlfriend. So I then got in my car, a manual, whilst on crutches with the staples, like 20 staples still in my knee, unable to bend or straighten it, in a manual car and drove six hours <laughs> to my girlfriend's house. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my mum because I knew she'd go mental. Um, I drove six hours like this to my fucking girlfriend's house, unable to walk in a manual car. And uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, got there anyway and now as out of hospital we could actually start like the road to recovery and start really start the, the rehabilitation process so I prioritized first of all getting better getting my flexibility and mobility back in my knee and I knew that it was like you get out what you put in and it's like people are left crippled by things and are left like um, like it, it, affected by things the rest of their life because they're not willing to put themselves through that pain they are not willing to be uncomfortable it's like, like, like it's, it's a beautiful metaphor for life it's like you have to be willing to put yourself through that physical or psychological pain to to push your comfort zone be it a physical pain or be it mental pain or fear whatever it is in order to get better and i i knew this from like previous experience i was like okay so we're really really gonna push it so first thing i did um when i got out of hospital was i went for a walk man with my girlfriend and like i can't tell you how nice it was to, was to just to be able to go outside and like smell fresh air and like smell a forest and not be in a hospital bed like the most simple things we take for granted every single day like there is someone out there that would love nothing more even your worst possible situation even this situation of me being in the hospital there's 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 people out there that would that are begging to be in that situation right now they're going through such hardship and yeah man when i got out it was just so nice to be have some kind of normality and like the the recovery process could start so this was the state I actually drove to my girlfriend's in like not able to walk at all um, i'm dragging myself naked to my girlfriend because i have no other way of getting around i didn't have my crutches there um and yeah uh, i drove like that time to get the staples removed and taken out of the leg after the staples are taken out of my leg we could then go to work in the gym how the leg, legs looking mate um yeah twigs <sighs> wow I didn't actually realize how fucking shit I looked. Um, this is the start of my sick, mad transformation. So the reason I was able to make so much progress so quick was because of muscle memory. I've had 10 years of training experience before this. So my muscles are like primed and ready to grow and ready to go. When you train, uh, what happens is your muscle cells are multinucleic. They have multiple cell nuclei within the cells. So you have a little cell, you have your nuclei within the cell. Muscle cells can have numerous nuclei throughout the cells. And these nuclei are what produces or assist in producing the proteins. The more nuclei you have within your cells, 
the more quickly you can produce muscle proteins. So because I have this 10 years of training experience prior to this, my muscle cells are incredibly dense with muscle cell nuclei. So I can synthesize protein, muscle protein very, very quickly, which is what muscle memory is. So the rate of progress that I made is probably comparable to someone on steroids, like without a doubt. Like I, I would not say you could do that without the, without assistance or without the previous training experience from muscle memory. So to answer your question, the reason I got so big so quick was because number one, muscle memory, number two, genetics, number three, my training and diet was absolutely on point. Number four, I had such a fucking burning desire to prove everyone wrong and absolutely smash this. All my life I've been told what I can't do. Like you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's like, it's, it's obviously my ego speaking, but like I, I use it as fuel as a big fuck you to all the people that tell me me the things that I can't do like it's what motivates me to train it what's what motivates me to to push boundaries to do things which other people aren't possible if you tell me I can't do something I will do it out of pure ego and just to like prove that fucking person wrong you know so it's like the surgeon telling me I'm not gonna get not gonna I'm not gonna regain that form ability in my leg I'm not gonna get to this point I'm like that drives me man that gives me fucking fire the people that are doubting that I'm gonna get back to where I was that I'm like beyond saving like that shit fucking fires me up. As soon as I could walk, as soon as the staples out of my knee, I started to train again. I still couldn't really walk properly, as you can tell. Um, I couldn't sit on machines with a bent leg because my knee wouldn't really bend. So I'd make some adaptations to the training, but we went in. The way that I trained was I prioritized recovery, first of all. For the first month, literally as soon as I, I was out of hospital, I started to do rehab exercises, um, recovery, things to improve flexibility and start to work towards that goal of getting fitter than, and healthier than ever. But the first phase for me was the priority was getting better, um, was getting that knee back to where it was. And whilst I did that, I trained as well. So what I did was I ran a split that was a hybrid split between rehabilitation exercise on my leg and bodybuilding type exercises on my upper body and the, 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 the kind of bodybuilding stuff I could do with the condition that my leg was in. In terms of upper body training, what I did was I didn't want to go straight back balls to wall into training because I hadn't trained in almost a month. So whether you're new to training, if you've taken a break for training, if you've got an injury, here's kind of like, this, you should kind of do a similar thing. So what I did was I started at a lower volume. So maybe I'd only do three exercises per muscle group per session. So chest, I'd only do like three exercises. With those exercises, I'd do two to three sets per exercise and I'd go nowhere near failure. So I'd do like RPE seven to eight, which is not like me because normally I love to train balls to the wall. So what I'd do then is for the first few weeks, I'd do reduced volume and reduced intensity just to get my body used to training again, just so I don't fuck myself up and like, like overtrain like too soon. After about four weeks, what I then started to do was increase the volume a little bit. But the main thing I started to do was really, really increase the training intensity. All my sets were balls to the wall, failure, focusing on progressive overload every single week. So I'd make sure I was either doing more reps or adding more weight to get stronger. I was tracking my lifts and following a structured training plan as well, whilst doing all the rehab work on my knee. And I kind of merge just like bodybuilding hybrid type split. If you want a solid program, um, I'll put a free program down below that's similar to what I am running or have run during this, during the transformation. Recovery continued, man. And I can't tell you how tedious it is to, to, to sit there for like half an hour, an hour, and just focusing on bending your leg when it seems like it isn't even moving. Like right, this one goes down, straight, this one doesn't. We gotta make it straight. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, progress was slow. Um, it's very frustrating. I want things now. I, I don't like being like being bad at things or, or waiting for things. So, but, but it's like, there's no way to, to cheat this. Like the only way you can get better, the only way you can go above and beyond is to, is to work, is to do it every single day, is to put in the work every single day. And it's like this exercise I hated where I try and lift my leg up. And as you can see, like I can't even lift my leg up off the ground. I'm just trying to literally lift my leg up, but my, my quad just wouldn't work. The, the muscle just atrophied so much that it just would not activate. How mad is that? That's my maximum. I just worry about never going back to normal, but. No, honestly, you're improving a lot. Like, I don't think you realise it, but I, I've seen you like from the start, kind of. So this is a lot more than you can do. Still got straight in my fucking leg. <sighs>
it's frustrating knowing that you're you're previously squatting like four plates for reps and now you can't even move no plates on a leg extension you can't even do a leg curl you can't do the most basic simple exercises because your leg just doesn't work but we stuck at it um, we kept working we slowly started to add resistance slowly started to see progress every day i would i would i would just push it harder and harder I started cycling um, on the machine just like a 10 minute warm up and every single rep on that or every single pedal was just agony because like my knee were like it it, it doesn't look bad but Every time it went up, it would be like hitting a nerve. It would feel like a nerve was getting hit and my knee wouldn't bend that much. But I'd keep going. I'd keep cycling every single day. And every day, inch by inch, I'd get low with the seat just to cause my knee to bend a little bit more and just to go in that right direction. Plan of attack for the training is I was going to spend a few months bulking up and then go on a cut. During the cut, I still got bigger because of the recomposition. So a recomp is where you lose fat and gain lose lose fat and gain muscle at the same time. There's a few different circumstances you can do this. Number one, if you're taking steroids, you can get bigger and lose fat at the same time. Number two is if you're new to training, which is good. So if you just started training and you train really intensely and train really well, you can actually lose fat and gain muscle at the same time. Number three is if you're obese, if you're really fat and have a lot of stored energy you can gain muscle and lose fat and number four is if you're a detrained individual so someone that's trained previously like me you are able to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time or recomp but for the vast majority of people it's better to stick to one or the other you got to choose whether you want to gain muscle or lose fat that's going to be the most efficient way of doing it i'm currently three weeks back into training um, i think it's easy to say at the end of like a transformation video or whatever, that I always knew I was gonna do it. But I'm three weeks in, this is a mobility on my leg. I will fucking do it. I will have the best physique of my life. I will be the most mobile and flexible and healthiest I've ever been. Just watch. For the first two to three months, we bulked up and we just didn't care about how much we ate. We just tried to eat as much as possible, did a proper fat boy, fat boy bulk, made sure I was hitting my protein, made sure I was getting my vegetables in, uh, ate out a lot, enjoyed myself, like enjoyed the freedom and not being trapped in a hospital room. It was around the beginning of February that I felt like my leg finally had enough stability and enough motion to start to incorporate some resistance training onto it. So this is the first leg press that I've done with no weight. I can barely even press the weight. I could probably do like five, six plates on it now um, out of surgery. And this like felt like a, a ton. This felt like a million pounds. But the fact that I can even do this was a victory in itself. Doing these sled push pulls that I said are really, really good. Um, I recommend to anyone with any knee problems you should be doing these. And uh, just pushing it day by day, man. Started doing me stretches as well. I think they're called couch stretches. Um, and as you can see, like I've barely got any mobility in my leg. Like it's, it's beyond 90 degrees now, which is good. It's probably at like 60 or 70. But I want to be able to touch my heel with my ass. So that is the goal. And I, I couldn't do that before the surgery. So what I do is I do these stretches every couple of days and just push it harder and harder and harder and harder until I start to get more and more and more mobile. Let's see if I can rep this. Just two places feeling heavy. But remember, kids, always lift with your ego and depend upon your lifting partner. I start a march for about 86 kilograms, still bulking up, still getting heavier, still getting fatter. You're starting to see it in my face. I actually, this is another brilliant idea for myself. I actually booked a snowboarding trip on the 18th of March, one month into my recovery when I still couldn't really walk. I was just off crutches. So I was like, okay, I'm going snowboarding next month. I'm setting this date. I'm going to be better by then, or I'm going to be able to snowboard and, and run by then. So about 10 weeks post-surgery, we went snowboarding, worked towards that. Everyone was telling me not to go, not to do it, how stupid it is. My parents are like, what are you doing? But I think if you remain in your comfort zone and don't push yourself and don't set these like ridiculous goals and you'll never get better. It's like, I'm not necessarily good at anything. Like I'm not mentally tough. I'm not especially like hardcore or anything like that. The, the reason that I, I do what I do and I get better so quick is because I'm just aware of the importance of doing shit that puts you outside of your comfort zone, doing stuff that isn't fun, isn't pain-free, isn't comfortable, isn't nice. It's like doing these things are what's going to make you grow. Slowly started to implement compound lifts back in. Um, started bodyweight squats, and then we started to slowly add in some weight in the form of a kettlebell. Again, like we're just kind of three, three sets for these on my legs, doing higher reps just to ease ourselves in and uh, really, really lightweight. Elevated my heels so we can get a 
easier so I can get better depth easier with heel elevation on squats because my knee mobility still wasn't great but as you can see that's pretty damn good man two months after the surgery and like this has literally said to me it was going to be impossible and, and we're squatting already which is like what the fuck mate what the fuck at the end of March we've had about two to three months bulking and I am pretty chubby 90 kilograms at five foot eleven and as you can see like we've got big we're we're pretty big here but we are pretty fat as well and the amount of mass that i gained is is pretty nutty it just goes to show the power of trend not joking just goes to show the the power of like a fat calorie surplus and consistently following a plan and training hard and smashing every one of your sessions final week of the bulk we're pretty chubby in the minute 90 kilograms and we're gonna absolutely smash this car have ever told you how pathetic and worthless you are <laughs> April is when the cut well and truly started to began. My calories are pretty high. I'm pretty sure I was on like 3,500 calories to start. And basically what we did is we started with very low cardio. Um, I'm not even sure I did cardio to start. No, I don't think I did. Um, we started with either very low walking or treadmill cardio. or and, and then, But the main thing we did was calorie restrict. So we don't want to restrict calories too hard. Um, we took my like calories that I was bulking on and just gradually decreased it by reducing the amount of carbohydrates that we're eating. So I think my macros off the top of my head was something like 190, 180 protein, 190 protein, um, around 60 fats on average. And then everything else was made up of carbohydrates. And then what I do is I track my macros every single day all throughout this. Um, during the bulk, I just have a baseline amount of macros, protein, carbs and fats meant to hit anything over that I wanted I'd have. And then in the cut would be more strict with it. Uh, take my weight every single day and then slowly reduce the calories in response to my weight. So if my weight was going down nicely, but keep things exactly the same. If my weight wasn't going down enough, then I would take away more carbohydrates from my daily macros uh, that I'd be tracking every single day using an app like MyFitnessPal and then just play it by ear and do that. We want to keep things as high as possible for as long as possible so we can still grow into the cut so we can grow whilst we're losing fat. And if we drop things down too low, we're going to start to eat into our muscles we're going to start to lose muscle as well as fat and it's not going to assist in our recovery but fortunately due to muscle memory due to training intensity due to having very good programming we were able to keep gaining muscle through the first few months of the cut so yeah um when we did that went into cutting phases in may uh, already looking pretty good here quite a few pounds down as you can see kept on pushing everything kept on pushing a recovery and just kept on going and being relentless with re everything that we're doing really man the the training like the motivation has been at an all-time fucking high like the biggest thing that i'd say let's be people down in the gym if you're watching this and you want to transform your body is your training intensity like i look around the gym and it's like I'm, I'm a bit of a dick for this but like i look at people i'm just i just think like why are you fucking here like what are you doing why are you wasting your time like people like literally there's a girl the other day on her phone on her phone whilst doing leg extension just texting i'm like what do you expect to achieve by doing doing this? Like you are going to look exactly the same if you don't put the effort in. Every set should be like a brutal, mutilating, self-loathing set to failure if you really want to change. What are you doing by training? What are you trying to do? You are trying to break your body down. Let's take it back. Why do we gain muscle? Why do we gain muscle? We gain muscle from an evolutionary standpoint to increase our chances of not dying, to live, to, to increase our chances of survival in the wilderness. We gain muscle. If we're like swinging through trees all day, then we're going to get stronger with certain muscles in our back and our arms. So we're better at swinging through trees. So we're, we're more adapted to the environment. In our like nice and easy lives that we live in today, we don't need muscle. We don't need to, we don't need, we, we don't need like to be, to be lean, to be ripped to be to have like to be strong so what we're effectively doing by going to the gym is tricking our body that there is this evolutionary selection pressure on us and that if we don't gain muscle we are gonna fucking die so you should be in with your training sessions you should be training like your literal life depends on it just think of it from the perspective of you are tricking your body into believing that you have to move this way you should be pushing yourself so hard that your your body has to adapt to the stimulus that you are applying on it the way it has to get stronger or it's going to die because it's not adapted to the environment so every session should be like that and i'll say that is the number one thing that people people don't bring enough intensity consistently into the sessions it's not good training like that once a week or twice a week it's like you've got to be consistently smashing those sessions smashing that intensity putting passion into the training and training with purpose and intention following a program and just aiming and striving for that progressive overload week by week because your body 
body doesn't want to change. We like comfort. We don't like... We don't like being in um, uncomfortable situations or putting ourselves through pain. We do not enjoy that. So it's like you've got to deliberately push yourself and be in that mindset to to transcend where you currently are. During this time, like I've, I've really found, like I found the balance as well in terms of going out for meals, um, enjoying myself, going out with my my friends, going partying, like having a break, but also not letting everything fuck up and not letting my physique slide and not letting everything fail. Like uh, learning how to live life, enjoy myself, and have a world class physique and be the fittest and healthiest I've ever been. I started running as well, um, just because I, again it's something I was told that I wouldn't be able to do, um, something I, I thought I'd never be able to do. And I'll make another video on that, but I've actually run every day. For the last 30 days and uh, started running, got super, super fit. Currently in the best shape of my life, mentally, physically. And uh, yeah, man, that's, that's pretty much everything, to be honest. Like, I don't really know really know what to say. Bulk for around two to three months, um, cut for around two to three months as well. Uh, just measured everything. What gets measured gets managed is a saying as well in, I think it's a British military. It's like proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. So plan what you're going to do, set a goal, set a date for that goal, work towards that goal, plan when you're going to cut when you're going to bulk, um, track your sessions, log how much weight you're lifting, log how much weight you're losing, etc, etc. And just really, really have intention when you do things. And especially for training, man, like don't slack off, don't waste your time and you, you will see changes. You will make completely transformative physique. Will you be able to get what I did in, um, in eight months? Probably not. Even with steroids, the vast majority of people are not going to be able to do that. So I don't blame people that, um, especially on Instagram, getting called out for like not being natty. Like I look at some of the injuries I've taken recently. I'm like, holy shit, this guy looks fucking ridiculous. I feel like I'm approaching the approaching the big fake natty daddies. I'm not quite yet there yet, but I'm like the, the prince below below uh, some of the big fake natty guys. To be fair, I was going to say Simeon, but I actually think Simeon could be natty. Uh, Micah Hearn, absolutely not. Simeon. I'd say it could be natty if it's BBC Genetics. But yeah, anyway, that's that's pretty much the entire transformation process explained. Um, I'll make more of a video on my diet and what I'm doing at the moment. But now the plan for me is just to maintain the shape around 85 kilograms, maintain a, a lean, solid physique whilst enjoying life, whilst going out, whilst having fun, and just get to a point where I'm, I'm shredded, I'm lean, I'm aesthetic, I look good, I feel good because I'm not like absolutely dick skin shredded. I'm not sacrificing all my life training. I'm not like eating out of Tupperware every single day. I'm still eating out. That's just the, the, the end goal for me now to enjoy to, to to enjoy my life to look great to feel great and just to get super super fit and like I can happily say that we are in the best shape of my life I'm the best place mentally and my life is probably the best it's fucking been period ever um and i just want to say as well thank you to everyone that's that supported me thank you to everyone on instagram that i got so many messages during this um like supporting me and like being there for me everyone that i couldn't get back to i'm sorry i literally got hundreds of messages uh i, I, I didn't reply to a lot of them because in like a as in like a pretty bad place at times obviously there's a lot of pain i wasn't really on my phone i don't want to be looking through instagram at everyone enjoying their christmases and stuff when i'm in hospital but i just want to say from the bottom of my heart thank you and also to my girlfriend man queen i fucking love you to bits like i wouldn't be able to do that without you my my parents as well um like every, everyone my friends everyone that's assisted me everyone that's trained with me like big big love because i wouldn't be here without you and it really did get me through that that dark like tough time that i was in during during all it, it did it did pull me through the, the the darkest most difficult times that i was in wasn't during this but anyway people um i hope that gave you some insight and clarity in terms of what i did in terms of like how i made progress so quick in terms of where i'm currently at right now also remember as well like this is a highlight reel so you're only going to see me in the best possible light with a fat pump um looking super full and super vascular like i don't walk around looking fucking wham all the time like i'm in pretty good shape but just take it as a pinch of salt. It is a highlight reel. Instagram, YouTube, all these people that you're seeing, it's like the best possible light, the best possible clip. I'm not putting clips where I look shitty. Um, so yeah, so so don't get, don't beat yourself up if you're not where you want to be. Compare your best with their best. And that's pretty much it. If you want a free program, I'll put a link for one down below. If you want to transform your physique, if you want a completely custom meal plan, custom training plan tailor-made for you, Physique Incubator has recently launched as well, which is my brand new coaching platform, completely custom tailored sub this for you based on your goals to help transform your body and get you to where you want to be for a very reasonable price. I wanted to make it accessible to as many people as possible. That's just launched link down below in the description to check it out. If you want to learn more, um, you can track your workouts with it, track your weight with it, progress pictures, there's recipes, there's shopping lists, there's a complete meal plan custom for you. Like I said, everyone will get individual personalized plans, training, meal, diet plans, and you'll get access to the community Facebook group as well. There's loads of shit. I'll just leave it for you to check out. Just remember marginal gains, 
small gains in the right direction every single day. Set goals, set dates, set deadlines. And if your goals and dates and deadlines don't scare the shit out of you and aren't difficult and don't put you outside a comfort zone, then maybe you need to do something else. Anyway, people, hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you want to see next time. Let me know if you've got any questions and uh, I will catch you in the next one. Peace out. I love you to bits. Thank you. Good night.